All right, hi everyone. I hope you guys had a wonderful spring break and are ready to get back to it and finish the semester strong. So today we're gonna to be talking about the theories of Gordon Allport, which as I'm gonna mention, he is going to be unique and different from several of the other theorists that we're gonna talk about this semester. And then after we talk about Allport this week, we'll move into trait theorists who will have very specific ideas about universal personality traits that can be applied to everyone. So today we're going to talk about Allport. You do have an activity that's going to be due by Friday at 5 p.m. So make sure to look for that in the lecture video. Let me know if you have any questions or if you need anything. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get into lecture for today. All right, so today we're going to be talking about the theories of Gordon Allport. Now, when we talk about Allport, we're going to be seeing that he would technically be considered a humanistic psychologist. So he would go in some of the same categories and believe similar things to Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, some of these individuals we've already talked about. The thing that's going to set Alport apart from other personality theorists is that he's going to focus a great deal on the individual. And Alport's going to suggest that it's not likely that we're going to come up with a universal theory of personality that explains every person. That the nature of personality is unique. And so each individual is gonna have different personality theory that fits them because they have different experiences and different characteristics. So Alport would be a humanistic, but he would also be very focused on the individual. And that is, like theoretically, that makes sense to us. It makes common sense. Of course, every person's personality is unique. And so then you might be asking yourself the question, why don't all theorists believe that each person has a unique personality, that it's impossible to have a universal theory of personality? That's a complex question that part of the answer to that would be that it's difficult to do research on that then. If we say that there's no way to define a healthy personality or an unhealthy personality, there's no way to then assess for personality, there's no way to diagnose personality disorders, so it makes research harder. I understand that that's not necessarily a great answer to that question, but it's one of the answers to that question. So we're going to see that Alport really focused on the psychology of the individual, focusing primarily on the uniqueness of each person. So he would say, that your personality is going to look very different from the next person's personality and that that's okay and that we shouldn't necessarily try to come up with a list of personality traits that apply to every person. Rather, we need to sit down across from a human being one-on-one -on -one and study them and learn about their personality and then we move on to the next person. We start again with a blank slate. We don't necessarily have this universal idea of what personality looks like. Now this is going to be very different from the people we're going to talk about in the next couple of weeks. So we're going to see that after we talk about Allport, we're going to talk about some theorists who suggested there were a very specific number of traits that really characterized everyone. So you're going to see the other side of this argument in the coming lectures. But today, Alport says, there is no way then to have a universal theory of psychology, or rather of personality. So he studied the individual. This is something that is called morphogenic science. In other words, he had a sample size of one. He would sit down and do research on a particular person. And we're going to talk about a couple of examples of this, of ways that he did this later on in the lecture. So rather than having a large sample size where he tried to find the things that are similar or connected between people, instead he would sit down with one person and try to deeply understand that person's personality. Now that's very, very interesting. It's like doing a case study. The problem with that is, as I said, that we are always looking for research that applies to the group, that applies to the population. Um, and so this doesn't necessarily fit with the way that we think about research in psychology as a field. So more on that later. Alport then says, although it is true that every person has a different personality, we do need a personality theory to help us try to understand who we are. However, it needs to be a broad theory. It cannot be a narrow theory. It cannot be a very specific theory because the more specific you get, the more you are talking about some people but not about others. So if you want to have a theory of personality that explains personality in everyone, it's going to have to be broad. So you're going to see that Alport is going to have a theory that has some general terms and some general ideas that could easily be applied to 
the vast majority of people. All right, so if we're talking about Alport, he was born in Indiana in 1897. Um, one of the things that we're going to see most here about Alport is that he met with Freud. So he had undergraduate degrees in philosophy and economics, and at the time that he met Freud, he was not already studying psychology yet, although shortly after his meeting with Freud, he would begin to study uh, psychology. So what happened was Alport found himself in Vienna, where Freud was living, and decided he would like to meet with Freud. And so he sent him a letter and Freud offered to meet with him. So during that time period, Alport tried to talk with Freud and found it incredibly frustrating. As you might imagine from some of the things we've already talked about Freud this semester. So remembering that Freud thought that everything was driven by unconscious impulses and that everything that was disturbing to us was repressed and we couldn't remember it and we have no conscious awareness of it and so there's this secret hidden layer of our personality that is now impacting everything that we do even though we don't know that it's there and Alport found that incredibly frustrating trying to talk to Freud. He was trying to have a straightforward conversation with Freud and Freud was trying to psychoanalyze him. So given that as with many other humanist uh, therapists or humanist theorists here, he didn't like psychoanalysis. He didn't like the idea that we can learn about personality by studying individuals who have personality problems. As other humanist theorists would say, we need to try to study healthy individuals and find out about healthy personalities. So he's going to strive to do that. So, if we're talking about Alport's theory, which makes sense, and it's fairly straightforward here, it's intended to be a general guide rather than a specific explanation of every facet of personality. Three questions. First of all, what is personality? Everyone that we have talked about this semester is going to have different ideas about what personality is. And then, your idea of personality is important because your idea of personality in general also then plays a role in your idea of someone who has personality issues or someone who is not uh, having a healthy personality. So you have to understand what personality is to understand what a healthy personality looks like. So Alpert would say it's both physical and psychological. Kind of the idea that who you are is made up of your mind and your body working together. So then your personality or your psychology, right, your psychological state impacts your health, your physical health and your physical health impacts your psychological state. And so personality then has to include both of these characteristics working together instead of trying to divide them separately. Um, he also would say that it includes both the overt and the covert. So overt means something that is obvious, something that you can see, something that you can hear, something that you can smell, taste, or touch. Covert is something that is less obvious, more subtle. So typically when we're talking about this in psychology, we're talking about the idea of a behavior. So an overt behavior would be something that you could see or hear me doing, for example. So right now I am lecturing to you and the words coming out of my mouth, those are overt behaviors. I'm speaking, I'm saying something you can see, well, at least hear, uh, my voice through this lecture video. Covert behavior, on the other hand, has more to do with your thoughts or your mental processes. Now, there has been an ongoing debate as to whether your thoughts are behaviors, and that's really not as relevant to this particular class. But if you think about it, someone who believes that your thoughts are behaviors would then be someone who would suggest that you should be able to control your thoughts and you should be able to um, kind of dictate your uh, ways of thinking and someone other individuals might say that you might not be able to do that so the idea here though according to Alport is that your personality a impacts your overt behavior what you do and what other people see you do as well as your covert behavior most of your covert behavior being something that you're thinking right um, if you're standing in the elevator and you're singing a song to yourself in your head that's the covert behavior right no one else in the elevator knows that you're singing that song in your head right we've all been there Good. Um, but it's the idea that your personality impacts both of those. So it says it not only is, but does. Basically, the idea is that if we have a personality, it's, it's a defining part of who we are, it's going to impact our behavior. Now, not always, okay, this is not a perfect correlation, but typically what we do lines up with who we are in some way. 
And so Alport would say that you can study a person's personality by studying their behavior and vice versa. They're related to each other. Of course, I'm sure we can all think of times when we did something or said something that we would say is not characteristics of a personality, but typically our behavior follows our personality, right? Um, basically, when we're seeing these last few bullets here, substance and change, product and process, structure and growth, it's the idea that we have a dynamic personality. So it is constantly changing and growing. But that doesn't mean that it's a random thing. It's that we are constantly becoming more mature, right? We're developing both physiologically and psychologically, our personality is developing. And so it has to be something where our personality is an important part of who we are, and it's fairly solid, but it does change some, right? As we talked about in the first activity of the semester, many of you said that you thought that personality needed to have room. Any personality theory needed to make room for change, that our personality does change over time. So it is a substantial part of who we are, but it does change, right? And that the process of changing is maybe just as important as how it changes, right? As we grow and we go through different life experiences, we know that that impacts who we are. So basically it's the idea that we have this, this personality characteristics that are guiding what we do and playing a role in what happens to us. And as those things happen, we grow, we mature, we change. And so maybe it does take until you're late 20s or early 30s to really solidify your personality because we're going through all this change process earlier on. So Allport is going to look to try to understand what is personality and his answer to that question is going to be it varies from person to person but it includes your physical health and includes what you do and what you think and it does change a little over time. Alright now then the question you might be asking yourself is if Alport was offended by Freud and disliked Freud's emphasis on the unconscious, then what would Alport have to say about that particular issue? Well, Alport suggested that healthy adults are primarily consciously motivated, right? Typically, they know what they're doing and they know why they're doing it. He disliked the idea that we are driven by these internal desires, maybe sex or aggression or whatever the case may be, that is now somehow below the surface impacting what we're doing. Now, Allport said, typically, a healthy adult knows what they're doing and why they're doing it. However, you see that it says some motivation is driven by hidden impulses. Alport would say that someone who has personality problems, um, a dysfunctional personality, that individual may have some like inner conflict that's kind of below the surface. He probably wouldn't have used the term unconscious perhaps, but it could be, could be unconscious. And so then the idea is that this only happens in the unhealthy individuals. Now, once again, if we're thinking about the sample size, we're thinking about who Freud studied. Freud did primarily study women who were coming to him because they were having these neurotic symptoms. So there could be some um, understanding here that perhaps an individual who is having personality problems might be more impacted by the unconscious. But Alport would say the conscious person, healthy adult, they know what they're doing. Okay, Now children might not yet understand what they're doing and why they're doing. And so maybe there are some of these behaviors that are not what we would consider conscious, healthy behaviors as adults. Maybe the only reason they're happening is because they started in childhood. Maybe when we were children, we were less mature and we had maybe more of an unconscious impact. Then we picked up these behaviors that have become habits and we continue to do that. So Alport's idea that the adults know what they're doing, typically then led him to accept their self-reported face value, which is something Freud would never do, right, if you think about that. Um, if you tried to tell Freud that you didn't have any of these unconscious conflicts, he would tell you you do and you're just not aware of them. Alport, on the other hand, would say that it would be um, arrogant, probably, for the clinician to then pretend, oh, I'm just speaking as Alport might have thought, um, pretend that they know more about the client than the client does themselves. So Alport would accept self-report. Now we know there are problems with self-report, right? When a client comes in, they might lie to you or they might think they're telling you the truth but their memory is, is not perfect, nobody's memory is, or maybe they have these biases they're not aware of. But for the most part, Alport would say that self-report, so what the client is telling you is what you should listen to. 
So then we ask ourselves the question, what does it mean to have a healthy personality? So Alport gave a list of six criteria here. This has been kind of a theme throughout the semester. We've had, and several of our theorists, an idea of self-actualization or having this healthy, mature personality. So Alport suggested six things. One, extension of the sense of the self. This is the idea that your personality and your understanding of yourself, your self-concept, is not necessarily just about you, but it is also about other people. It's also about having relationships with other people. So a healthy, mature adult will then extend their self-concept to include maybe a romantic partner, maybe friends, maybe children, right? Maybe um, people at their work, their job, people that they're able to come in contact with and help, that kind of thing. Um, it also says a warm relating of self to others. This means that they're pretty comfortable having intimate relationships. They're comfortable with having a commitment to another person. Um, emotional security or self-acceptance, just like it uh, makes sense, just like it says here that this person is comfortable with who they are. Maybe they're aware of who they are and they're okay with that, which leads into a realistic perception of their environment. So maybe they understand their own weaknesses, they understand their strengths, they understand the people in their life, and they feel comfortable with that. Um, insight and humor, just as we said here. And then uh, unifying philosophy of life. The basic idea here is that according to Alport, a healthy individual will then have maybe this idea of what they want out of life and that will then direct them towards goals. Maybe they'll have general ideas and maybe when you're younger you don't know for sure what you want but you have general ideas about what you might like to do for a career or what kind of person you might want to marry or whether you want to get married or have children. So. This unifying philosophy of life is the general idea of what you want out of life and a goal-oriented kind of thing. Okay, now, remember when we're talking about Alport, we're talking about his individual psychology, his studying of an individual rather than a group of people. So his theory of personality is going to be general. It's going to have to be broad. It cannot be overly specific because the minute that it becomes overly specific, then it's leaving some people out. So keep that in mind. Basically, Alport said, your personality is made up of personal dispositions. Okay, Your personal disposition is a trait. I'm not sure he would like the use of the word trait, but we'll go with that. A trait um, that is specific to who you are. So, how many different potential personal dispositions are there? Thousands. Millions, perhaps, right? We know that there are lots of possible answers to this question of what is it that makes you who you are? A trait that is specific to you. This is going to be different from what we're going to talk about next week. Next week, when we talk about trait psychology, we're going to talk about the idea that maybe there's five traits and everyone falls somewhere on a spectrum with those five traits and that's who you are. On the other hand, Allport would say every person has different traits and different levels of different traits and that's why we're all individuals. So he would say there are three levels of personal dispositions here which are basically just the the personality traits that characterize who you are individually. So we have cardinal dispositions or cardinal traits, central dispositions, secondary dispositions. So. A cardinal trait or a cardinal disposition is like the most pervasive, powerful thing in your life, right? Now, Alport would say not everyone has these, but maybe you can think, and I'm going to ask you for the activity this week, you'll see on the next slide, I'm going to ask you to think about this in your own life, but maybe there is something about who you are that is like your, your passion, right? And it, it impacts everything that you are. Maybe that is has something to do with religious beliefs. Maybe that has something to do with uh, family, with relationships. Maybe it has to do with a career, whatever the case may be. Alport would say not everyone has cardinal traits or cardinal dispositions, but this is like an overruling, powerful force that really impacts your behavior. Uh, your passion, basically, is the idea that you have a passion. Now, think about this. Some individuals have a passion, and it's good for them and they love it, and they get so much joy and fulfillment out of it. Can we also see, though, that it's possible to have a passion that maybe is not healthy for you? Like, maybe if the passion is your work, that's good until you find yourself, like, being a workaholic, not being able to leave your work, leaving everything else because of your work, right? Maybe we find, like, money and success and fame become our cardinal disposition or passion in life and then ends up hurting 
us in the long run. So a cardinal disposition or a cardinal trait is basically just your passion. Now everyone has those. However, everyone has central dispositions or central traits. Now Allport would say typically most people have somewhere between 5 to 10 of these. But the 5 to 10 that you have would be different from the 5 to 10 that I have or that the next person has. So your central traits are basically those personality characteristics that describe who you are. So like, for example, if you think about your best friend or your sibling or your roommate and somebody said, who is, what is this person like? The things you would use to describe them would be their central dispositions. Maybe you would say, oh, well, that person is kind, outgoing, funny, right? Those would be the central dispositions. So your cardinal disposition has to do with one overruling passion that you may or may not have. Your central disposition is like more like we think about specific personality traits, although the traits that are true for you are not necessarily found in every person, right? And so then finally, when we're talking about secondary dispositions or secondary traits, these are parts of your personality as well, but they're fairly weak. In other words, they don't necessarily stay consistent. They can change over time more so than the others can. And also, maybe they're not as obvious. They don't really impact your behavior that much. So maybe you have certain traits maybe or certain beliefs about what kind of food you enjoy or, or what kind of music you like to listen to. The kind of music that you like to listen to can change over time. That's part of your personality, but it doesn't necessarily predict what you do, and it's not necessarily obvious. So how many people in your life know a lot about your, your taste in music? I mean maybe a, a, someone that you're in a relationship with, maybe a family member or a friend, but most people don't know that. It's not obvious and it doesn't really guide your behavior that much, um, unless you're a musician, in which case maybe then it wouldn't be a secondary disposition. Maybe it would be a central disposition for you. So cardinal disposition is an overruling passion. Central disposition would be just a personality trait, five to ten things that say, okay, I am this person, I'm a friendly person, or I'm an aggressive person, or I'm an outgoing person. Um, and then secondary dispositions are, are kind of like things that we like or dislike, right? Maybe there are certain things that we enjoy or don't enjoy that can change over time, whether we like being outside or inside, whether we like watching TV or, or not, that kind of thing. They're, they're preferences. And so who you are, then, is some kind of combination of all of these three. Now, Alport would make a distinction here between motivational and stylistic dispositions. Okay. A motivational disposition is a part of your personality that drives your behavior. It leads you to do things, right? So maybe if you're an outgoing person, maybe that drives you to go find friends, to go find people to spend time around, for example. And so then that part of your personality led directly to your behavior. On the other hand, a stylistic disposition is something that doesn't necessarily cause you to do a behavior. It might guide your behavior a little bit once you're in a situation, right? Maybe you say, okay, well, when someone is close to me standing in line, I might be more likely to smile at them and talk to them, but I'm not going to go seek them out. It's something that kind of guides your behavior, but it doesn't necessarily start the behavior going. And of course, we can see there's some overlap between these two. So then, the proprium here is Alport's term for your personality, basically. So some of the other terms we've seen throughout the semester, the self or the ego, right? Um, Alport's term here is the proprium. So it says behaviors that are regarded as warm, central, and important to our lives, right? This is basically his idea of who we are, maybe our core personality, our core who we are, right? Deep down inside, this is who we are. So then we see that who you are is made up of all of these different dispositions. It's made up of your experiences throughout your life, right? And it's going to guide your behavior. And it's going to be unique to you because different people have different dispositions and have different experiences, okay? So the activity for this week is going to ask you to describe your own personal dispositions using Alport's term. What is your personality like? So it says, tell me some cardinal traits, if you have cardinal traits. So if you have overruling, overriding passions in your life, tell me about that. Um, central traits, so those parts of your personality that someone might mention when they're describing you to another person. And then secondary traits, maybe preferences that you have that might still impact you a little bit, but less so than these other traits. 
And then it says, how do your personal dispositions impact your behavior? So I want you to think about how your, especially cardinal traits and central traits, but secondary traits as well, perhaps, how they actually impact your behavior and change what you do, right? So that's your activity for this week. Let me know if you have any questions about that. All right. So remembering that Allport suggested we can't really have a, a universal theory of personality. We have to have uh, an idea of personality that changes depending on which person we're studying. Morphogenic science, we mentioned this term earlier, basically it's the study of a particular individual. It's kind of like a case study. So if you've heard of examples of case studies, that's the idea that you have one person, usually one, it could be a small sample size of two or three, but usually one, and you get all the possible information that you can. You interview that person, you interview their family, their friends. If it's a child, you talk to their teachers. If it's an adult, you talk to roommates and, and coworkers and bosses. And then you also have that person fill out surveys, answer questions, depending on what you're interested in. Maybe you do personality testing or intelligence testing, right? You get a lot of information on one particular person, right? So a couple of examples of how Alport did this. The first one talks about the diaries of Marion Taylor. Now, he did not actually publish this research, but he acquired these diaries of this woman. And it, they were extensive. They gave a ton of information. And then he also interviewed people that knew this woman. And from that, he tried to come up with an idea of what her personality is like. Now, <clears throat> some of us would suggest, I mean, if you think about this, this is a sample size of one. So that doesn't mean that what he found about her necessarily applies to anyone else. And then other people would also say, now we know that just because someone wrote something in a diary doesn't necessarily mean that it happened or that it was an accurate perception of what happened. But still, um, there's a lot of value here in studying deeply a particular person. Maybe the idea is that when we do research on a vast number of people, we can only get a small information from a small amount of information from each person. And so then maybe we lose something in that. And maybe the best way to study personality is to extensively study a person. He did the same thing here with something called Letters from Jenny. So this was a situation, uh, a woman that he and his wife exchanged um, many, many letters with. And during that time of corresponding with her, he and some of his students really tried to get, based on what she was writing in her letters, tried to get a good grasp on her personality. So they did all kinds of different things here. They used factor analysis, which we're going to talk about factor analysis extensively next week. But it's basically a statistical uh, technique to try to find whichever factors are especially prevalent here in this person. We're going to talk a lot more about it next week. But he used some statistical things based on what words she was using. But he also used what he would call a common sense approach. It seems to me like, uh, based on what she's saying, remember he took self-report pretty straightforward as who they truly are. And he did extensive research on this particular individual, and he did actually publish this research. So this is very different from what we typically hear of when we think about psychology and research, but it's very interesting getting kind of qualitative information, which means less about numbers, which would be quantitative, but more qualitative, um, having her write out experiences and trying to analyze them. The research is a little bit more complicated this way. The statistics are more complicated, but it's very, very interesting to get to know someone in depth. So when we're talking about Alport, one of the last things to mention here is Alport did a lot of research on religion. So he was interested in how individuals who have religious beliefs, how that impacts their health as well as their behavior. And so what basically what he had found was that he knew, and many of us may be able to relate to this, he knew people who were highly religious, who were kind, loving, happy individuals, and he knew people who considered themselves high, highly religious, who were um, not nice people to be around, maybe um, racist, or maybe they just looked down on people, they disliked people, but they were highly religious. So Allport sought to try to understand what that could be, how that could happen. And so he came up with this idea that there is an extrinsic orientation and an intrinsic orientation for religion. And that your orientation here is going to play a role in how you respond to other people and it's going to impact your health as well. 
So someone who has an extrinsic orientation, basically what this means is that they go to church or they do whatever their religious uh, practices are because they've always done that, because their family did that, because they want to spend time. So church or, or wherever is basically a social event where they do consider themselves religious, but they're really not going for religious reasons. They're doing these things because of social reasons, perhaps. And so then, therefore, they have an extrinsic orientation. On the other hand, Alport found some individuals he would characterize as having an intrinsic orientation towards religion. These individuals truly believed what they were saying, and it impacted and it showed in the things that they did and the ways that they interacted with people. So these are individuals who are not just going to to church or or anything like that just to be around other people. They're doing it because of a deep, intrinsic, internal desire um, based on their religious beliefs. So what they found here is that individuals who, and some of this research has been expanded upon here, as you can see a couple of examples. So individuals who are extrinsically oriented towards religion were actually more likely than the average individual to express some of these kind of like judgmental beliefs or to look down on other people. So the individuals who are doing these religious practices because of social reasons are more likely to look down on other people or to judge other people. On the other hand, the individuals who have this intrinsic orientation who are doing their religious practices because they genuinely believe in it and it's something that is a deep personally held belief for them, they're less likely to be judgmental and harsh and to mistreat people than the average person. So it's not just that someone is religious, it's also how they characterize that religious belief. So we've also found that this is related to your physical and psychological health. So intrinsic religious orientations, those individuals tend to have better psychological and physical health than the average person. Whereas someone who has an extrinsic orientation towards religion is someone who is probably going to have more health problems than the average person and more psychological problems than the average person. So it's the, it's the idea basically that someone who has deeply held religious beliefs they are more likely to be able to handle life stress, maybe handle death, um, maybe being able to handle everyday difficulties, or maybe being able to handle health problems of their own in a more adaptive way. Or maybe it's because they have, they have hope, they have peace. Whereas someone who is doing these religious practices just for social reasons or because that's what they've always done, that individual is actually more likely to have health problems and psychological problems than the typical person. So just another way that we have to look at a particular person in depth to be able to get this information. So if we're looking at 500 people, how many questions can we ask them about their religious beliefs? But if we're looking at a small number of people, maybe we can get more questions and we can kind of tease out the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic religious orientations. All right, last couple things here. Allport's theory, it's high on parsimony. Think about that. Parsimony means that it's not more complicated than it needs to be. Allport's theory is pretty straightforward. It's internally consistent. Um, it's difficult to do research like this, as I said, because usually we do research with a large sample size, trying to find the things that are in common among several people. So trying to find things that are unique is a different kind of research. So some research has been done here. Um, and guiding action has to do with like being able to practically apply it to your clients. Um, it's low on falsifiability because it's kind of hard to disprove any of this. Um, and it doesn't necessarily help us when we're sitting down across for another person trying to organize what we know. All right, last thing. Alport's concept of humanity. Free choice would be definitely emphasized here. Um, some of the other theories that we've talked about, Freud, for example, would suggest that your unconscious desires really impact who you are, whereas Alport would say they don't. So then you do have free choice here. Alport would also say that you're not necessarily um, always permanently damaged by difficult experiences that you've had earlier in life, that you can overcome that. It's very optimistic, absolutely conscious over unconscious. Remember that Alport said, 
individuals who have psychological problems may be impacted by unconscious motivations, but that if we're healthy adults, typically conscious. Uh, social influence, so the people that are around us nurture more than nature, and then the biggest thing here is definitely uniqueness. So each person is different, and so then we have to try to find their differences without trying to lump people into categories. Good. All right. That is the end of lecture for this week. So remember that you do have an activity that's going to be due by Friday at 5 p.m. Feel free to shoot me an email or come by my office hours if you have any questions. Otherwise, next week we will talk more about five-factor theory traits. We're going to talk more specifically about traits that might be universal rather than individual. So I'll talk to you guys then.